Welcome to the Hackberry House of Chosun. My name is Bob, and I'm reading today from the Free Grace Broadcaster on Meditation. This is the fall issue, 2018, and these uh, little booklets that are filled with the words of men of God of past generations can be sent to your house freely, not by me, but by someone. It's uh, You want to go over to, I'm sorry, I'm... I'm not as quick as I used to be. Chapel at MountZion.org. Chapel at MountZion.org. Or just go to www.chapellibrary, two L's in the middle, .org. It's a ministry of the Mount Zion Bible Church. They're called the Free Grace Broadcaster. They'll be sent to your house quarterly. You can read them yourself. Um, but I like reading them too. This is by Edmund Calamy. He lived from 1600 to 1666. He goes way back, and yet he has truths for us today about meditation. It's a it's a neglected science among us in the church, and uh, he's very insistent that there are dangers of neglecting meditation. And that's uh, the name of his article. I shall show you the woeful inconveniences and the intolerable mischiefs that come from the lack of practicing this duty of Meditation. I will show you that the lack of practicing this duty is the cause of all sin, and I will instance in particulars. Number one, the reason why people harden their hearts in sin and do not repent of their sins but go on obstinately is for lack of meditation. Jeremiah 8, 6, I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? No, they did not repent because they did not reflect upon what they did. They did not bethink themselves. And so the phrase is, if they shall bethink themselves and repent, bethink, that is, collect their thoughts and repent. They did not say, I am undone by what I have done. I have lost God in heaven by what I have done. And if I do not repent, I am an undone creature forever. No man repented of his wickedness because no man considered what he had done. For did you consider the evil that is in sin? Did you dwell and abide upon it? Did you commune with your own hearts and seriously consider what an evil and bitter thing it is to sin against God? You durst not willingly sin against God. The reason why men go on rashly, heedlessly, obstinately in sin is for lack of the meditation of the evil of sin. Number two, the reason why all the sermons we hear do us no more good is for lack of divine meditation. For it is with sermons as it is with food. It is not having food upon your table that will feed you, but you must eat it. And not only eat it, but prepare and digest it or else your food will do you no good. And so it is with sermons. It is not hearing sermons that will do you good, but digesting them by meditation. Pondering in your hearts what you hear must do you good. One sermon, well digested, well meditated upon, is better than 20 sermons without meditation. Now, meditation is that which will digest all the sermons you hear. There are some men sick with a disease that, that whatsoever they eat comes up presently. The meat never doth them any good. So it is the custom of many of you. You hear a sermon, you go away, and, and you never think of it afterward. It's just like food that you vomit up. There's a disease that some men have that all the food they eat goes through them. It never abides with them. Now this food never nourishes and so it is with the sermons you hear, I am sure, on the weekday. And I'm afraid the sermons you hear on the Sabbath day go through you. You hear them and hear them, and that's all you do. You never seek by meditation to root them in your hearts. That's the reason why you're so lean in grace, that you are so fully fed with sermons. It is with sermons as it is with a a plaster, now that, that was a cloth with medicinal salves applied to a part of the body 
for healing, a plaster. If a man hath a wound in his body and lay a plaster to the wound, this plaster will never heal him unless it abides upon the wound. If he takes it away as soon as ever it is laid on, it will never do him any good. So it is with sermons. If when you have heard a sermon you never ponder and meditate on it, it's just like a plaster put on and then pulled off again. I'm confident the great reason why we have so many hunger-starved Christians that are lean in knowledge and lean in grace, though they hear sermon upon sermon, it may be on the Sabbath day they will hear four or five sermons, it's because they concoct and digest nothing. They never ponder and meditate upon what they hear. And this is what our Savior, Christ, speaks of. By the seed that was sown by the highway side is meant a man that hears the word and never thinks of it after he's heard it, but suffers the devil to steal it out of his heart. As the husbandman that sows the seed in the highway, you know he never plows it, he never looks that it should come to anything. For many of you, the sermons you hear are like the seed sown in the highway. You never cover it by meditation. You never think of it when you have heard it. That's the reason you get no more good by what you hear. Number three, the reason why the promises of God do no more affect your hearts, when the saints of God taste no more sweetness in the promises, is because you do not ponder and meditate upon them. It is with the promises of the gospel as it is with a cordial. That's a pleasant tasting medicine. If a man doth not chew his medicine, but swallow it down whole, he'll never taste any great sweetness in it. The way to taste the sweetness is to chew it. And so the promises of God are full of heavenly comfort, but you'll never enjoy this comfort unless you chew them by meditation. As it is with spices, unless they be bruised, they never smell sweet. As it is with a pomander, that's a, a ball or perforated container of sweet-smelling substances, such as herbs and spices. You suspend this by a chain from your neck or waist to preserve it against infection. It says, unless you do rub it, this pomander, you'll never smell the sweetness of it. No more will you ever taste the heavenly comfort that is in the promises of the gospel. Unless you rub them, unless you bruise them, unless you chew them by meditation. The reason why the saints of God walk so uncomfortably all their lives long is because they do not chew these promises. Number four, the reason why the threatenings of God make no more impression upon our hearts is for lack of meditation. There are terrible threatenings against sin in the word, but alas, there are few people affected with these threatenings. The threatenings of God in Scripture are like the rattling of hail upon the tiles. That would be the, the thin slabs of burnt clay that are used to roof a house. You know what a tile is, but a little different in those days. Uh, they make a great noise, but they make no impression when hail comes down on the tile. But what is the reason it's for lack of meditation. We do not lay them to heart. We do not consider that these threatenings belong to us as long as we continue in our sins. Oh, if a wicked man meditates solemnly upon the threatenings of God, it would make his heart ache, especially when the spirit of bondage goes along with them. Number five. The reason why the mercies of God do no more good upon us is for lack of of meditation. There are many mercies that all of us have received from God, um, many personal mercies, many family mercies, and all these mercies are so many motives to service. Now, what is the reason the saints of God bury the mercies of God in forgetfulness and are no more thankful for mercies? The reason is for lack of meditation. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. Isaiah 1, 1, 
verses 2 and 3. That is the reason why they are so unthankful. It is with the mercies of God as it is with the fire. If a man walks by the fire and doth not sit at it, it will never heat him much. If he be cold, he must abide at the fire or else he'll never be hot. So it is not a, a slight thought of the mercies of God that will affect your hearts, but it must be a dwelling upon them by meditation that will warm your hearts. Now, because we do not meditate upon these mercies, we do not solemnly consider the mercies of God. Therefore, it is that they do no more good upon our hearts. There is a psalm spent on purpose to set out the unthankfulness of the people of Israel. Psalm 106. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. So what is the reason they were so unthankful? It's because they did not meditate on the mercies of of God. Number six, the reason why afflictions do work no more upon us and why we are never the better for the afflicting hand of God is for lack of meditation. Ecclesiastes 7.14 is a rare text. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider. Times of affliction are times of meditation. And of what must we consider in the day of adversity? We must consider who it is that afflicts us, why we are afflicted, and what we shall do to have our afflictions sanctified. We must consider the meaning of God's rod and how we may be taught spiritual things by these afflictions. Now, because we do not meditate upon God and upon his afflicting hand when we are afflicted, because we have slight heads, that is, foolish or unwise thinking, under our afflictions, we get little good by our afflictions. I've observed that as soon as ever we are recovered from our afflictions, many of us, the Lord pardon it unto us, forget God presently. We never consider the mercies of God in recovering us. And then we return to our own vomit again for lack of meditation. Number seven, the reason why the providences of God and take no more impression upon our hearts is for lack of this grace of meditation. The providences of God are very mysterious, and God, in the government of the world, doth walk in the clouds. And truly, I am very confident that what God doth especially require of his children in these days is to meditate upon his providences as well as upon his ordinances. There are many rare lessons to be learned from the consideration of the providences of God. Now, what is the reason that the providences of God of recent years do no more good to us? The reason why we are never the better by them is because we do not study the meaning of all these providences. Isaiah 57, 1 says, The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. Merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. This is the reason why we get no more good by the death of the godly and by the providences of God. We do not lay them to heart. We do not muse and study upon them. Number eight, what is the reason that the saints of God are so distrustful of God's providence that when they are ready presently to sink and to say they are undone? It's for lack of meditation. And therefore Christ saith, take no thought for your life what you shall eat neither for your body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. It's food and clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They neither have storehouse or barn, and God feeds them. How much are you better than the fowls? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, and yet I say to you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If you considered the lilies and the ravens, if you studied the love of God to you, you would trust him under any sad providences. 
the reason why the saints of God are so full of unbelief when they are in a low condition is for lack of meditation. They do not consider the ravens and the lilies. They do not study the promises that God hath made to his children in their lowest condition. Number nine. The reason why the professors of religion are so censorious or harshly critical of other men and so little censorious of themselves, why they judge every man and examine every man but themselves, which is the condition of these days, is for lack of meditation. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? If men did reflect more upon themselves, they would censure themselves more and others less. The reason why people are so rash in censuring is for lack of self-reflection. Number ten. The reason why professors of religion do offer the sacrifices of fools to God when they come to worship him, why they pray headily and rashly, why they rush upon ordinances without preparation is for lack of meditation. Ecclesiastes 5.1, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. Be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. Why do people rush upon ordinances without preparation, rush upon sermons, rush upon prayer, rush upon holy duties? Why, they do not consider what they do. Number 11, what is the reason that people prepare no more for death? Because they do not consider the shortness of life. They do not meditate of the vanity of this life, of the certainty and uncertainty of death. Therefore it is said, oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. And Deuteronomy thirty-two twenty-nine, Because men do not consider their latter end, therefore it is that they are so unprepared for their latter end. 12. And lastly, what is the reason that we come so unworthily and to the Lord's Supper. And when we are there, we gaze up and down and carry ourselves so unseemly at that ordinance. What's the reason that we lose all the fruit of that ordinance, but, but merely for lack of preparation before we come in meditation when we are come? Now, preparation cannot be without meditation. And preparation includes meditation in it. Now, that's where the article ends. It's from a work called The Art of Divine Meditation, Edward Calamy. He was an English Puritan church leader and theologian, born in London, England, UK, 1600. Wow. Well, we still have a lot of work to do. I hope that you'll look around the website between now and the next time you come and find that there's a whole lot stuff here. I just can't go over it each time, but we're talking 2,300 audios, I believe, at this point. That'll keep you busy browsing for a little while, I do believe. God bless you for being here today, and Lord willing, we will talk again soon. This is the Hackberry House of Chosun.